Oh my, praise the Lord. I'm telling you how God blesses us with uh, musicians and people that are just so dynamically talented, you know, and, and will use that for the Lord. Uh, I was, you know, of course, obviously I think of it a lot because uh, in ministry, uh, the, the, the ministry of a church is really only as gifted as the, the people that God has placed into, into the church especially uh, with, with churches that are, that are um, the size and, and the scope and the wealth and the, all of that of the church is, is a smaller kind of thing. You know, you just, you don't have paid professionals and so forth that are doing all the ministries that you have and that need to be done. It, it's truly the body of Christ. It's truly the church itself that God has blessed to use their talents and their abilities and their time and their efforts and you know all of our children's ministry, uh, youth youth ministry, uh, nursery people, uh, even the people that clean up and, and do those kind of things, and certainly our musicians are all people that are gifted by the Lord and they're willing to use their gifts and talents. And they have been, you know, this is uh, what twelve years now as a church for twelve years. And all of these, you know, that you see up here and many that are working in other areas, they've been doing that for 12 years. And it's amazing how, and, and they just love what they do and they do it so graciously and God blesses it. So anyway, uh, it, it's, it's wonderful to be a part of a, of a group and, the, and that the Lord has blessed our church with that. And hopefully your life has been blessed with all the things that, uh, that God does through all the ministries in the church. I know you, you got your outline. I looked at it um, this morning, again, as I'm kind of just trying to get back in my heart what the Lord's saying, I'm thinking, good night. I got to do all of that today? <laughs> I mean, it's like, what was I thinking? Um, anyway, uh, let's give it a shot. Let's see what the Lord's going to do today because I, I started a little brief series and today's the second message of the series. There, there's probably at least one more, maybe two more messages and, and they may even be after Christmas but uh, but I'm calling this little brief series the gift of the, the gift of grace, the gift of glory, and the glory of God. His grace is His glory, and when we talk about glory, we're talking about uh, a revelation of uh, of what's on the inside of God, the character of God, the nature of God is His glory, what He's known for, what people see, the manifestation of who God really is, is called His glory. Um, I guess an, an official theological thought might be uh, glory means the outward manifestation of an inward reality. Whatever you really are on the inside, when it's manifested on the outside so that people can see it, that would be your glory. And so God reveals his glory through the fact that he is so gracious and, and his grace is the revelation of who he really is and every time he describes himself, he uses terms like grace and mercy first before he says anything else about himself. You know, most people, when they think of God, they think of judgment or they think of uh, justice or uh, truth or, or something that might, you know, create a, create a barrier between uh, people, uh, their motives and, and how they view God and how they approach God. And God is truthful. Not, he's not only truthful, he is the truth. God is the truth. And so he's not only truthful and he's not only just, but he says, you know, the first thing I want you to know about me is that I'm gracious and I'm merciful. That's, that, that, that's, that's the key that I want you to think of because if you don't see God in that way, you're not gonna come to God. If you see God, I, I used kind of like a little, uh, I guess an official uh, phrase last week would be the best way to describe it. Uh, the phrase was, uh, we can't get any closer to God than our concept of God will allow us to. In other words, you have a concept of God right now in your life and how you view God right now in your life has everything to do with how close you come to God. Because if you, if, if you believe God is mad at you, you believe that God doesn't care about you, 
You believe God has the commandments in one hand and a bat in the other hand just waiting for you to step out of line, looking at you and going, just do it one more time. <laughs> oh, I'm going to, whoo, you're going to be sorry you ever did. If that's your concept of God, you're not going to come close to God. Who would want to come close to an angry God like that? You're going to stand at a distance. You're going to keep him at arm's length because you're afraid. And you, God is not your heavenly father. He's that, that mean ogre in heaven that's just looking for a time to pounce on you. Well, if that's your concept of God, you're not going to come close to God. You're not going to let God father you. You're going you're to keep him at arm's length and stand at a distance. And so the purpose for messages like last week and this week and, and any other message that might come in this little brief, you know, the Gift of Grace series is really to um, try to help remove all of those filters that we have about who God is so that we can see God as he really is. And if we can see him as he really is, we will love God and we will come close to God and we will allow God to uh, father us that, and we'll allow him to, uh, to take us and, and be merciful and be gracious to us and we will get on his lap and say, Papa, you know, help me and, and we'll be close to God. So the purpose is to hopefully remove these filters that we have because sometimes of the way we were brought up, sometimes of the families we were brought up in, the people who affected our concept of God and life, which is our parents are dynamically image bearers of God. Uh, I know that's a scary thought, especially if you are a parent, to think that you are reflecting the image of God to your children and that their thoughts about who God is, you are the major image bearer of God. That's really a scary thought. But you know, psychologically and emotionally, it's proven to be true that what people think about God has a lot to do with what they think about their parents. Bill Glass, and I know you probably have not heard that name, but Bill Glass has a prison ministry and he has for, oh gosh, 25 years or more. And he's gone into all the prisons of America. He said he's done so much time in prison that he could you know, assault somebody or whatever and he wouldn't have to do any time because he's already served all of his times. He, he's, he's seen hundreds of thousands of inmate, inmates and his testimony is that he has not met one inmate, male or female, in his entire ministry who do not hate their father. That's one of the characteristics that they all have in common is they, they, they might give mom some slack, but they hate their fathers. And in a recent book, Paul Vitz, and you probably not heard that name, but unless you study sociology, but he wrote a book called Faith of Our Fathers, The Psychology of Atheism. He studied famous atheists from all times, and he found out that one truth about all of these famous atheists is that every one of them hate their fathers. And that one of, and the psychology of their atheism is because they don't want to, they don't want to believe that their father exists. They don't believe God exists because they really wish their father didn't exist. And so it's a, it's a major deal. And I know that today, you know, some of you come from great families, wonderful families. Some of you come from highly dysfunctional families. Some come from non-existent families. Some co come from families who, who the father is a harsh, mean ogre and mom doesn't care and they're moody and they're dysfunctional and they're not graceful and they have no sympathy and they have no compassion. And so you, you know, that the tendency is then for you to believe that God is that way. And it's hard for you to, you know, I, I mean, I, I didn't come from a terrible family, but I did come from a totally dysfunctional family. And I'm wondering, does anybody come from a functional family? I mean, really, I mean, who, who have I ever met that really came from a functional family? Totally. But I came from a really dysfunctional with an alcoholic dad and so forth. And, a, and my mom worked in a, as a nurse and she was gone lots of times. And we were brought up by uh, someone who was hired uh, and, 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 and brought us up. And love, God bless her soul, love her. But, but the point being that when you're uh, in an absentee kind of a situation, you, you, know, you grow up and one of, the, one of the barriers that I had to overcome to come to Christ was to believe that Christ wanted to be close to me. 
because I didn't come up in a family where my parents really wanted to be close to me. Well, they might have, but they weren't, and I, and I judged that as, uh, uh, you know, that, that's not something that would happen, and so I had to fight through that thought that God doesn't really want to be close to me and that God doesn't really care deeply about me, and, and I had to fight through that in order to come to him. That was one of the biggest barriers that I faced in life, and so we all have these kind of barriers and these filters, but the truth is that God wants to be close to us and he, he pursues, I'm gonna use a, an experience in God term, those of you that have been through our journey classes, one of the journey classes is uh, the, seven experience, the seven principles of experiencing God. The first principle is God is, at all, uh, God is always at work around you. The second principle, uh, those of you that have been through the class, help me out, uh, God pursues uh, continuing love relationship with you that is real and personal. Uh, the, the second principle is God's always at work around you, number one. Number two, God pursues a continuing love relationship with you. What does God want from you? He wants to have a continuing love relationship with you that, is, that has two characteristics. Number one, it's real, and number two, it's personal. It's not cosmic, it's not, it's not group relational, it's not like, all right, God loves all of us. Yeah, that's true, but God loves you particularly, not just us. He loves you, and he wants a relationship with you that is real and personal. And, and, and that's the concept that God presents of himself in his word, and that's what I would like to promote to you is the way God is. It's the nature of God, and it's really important that we see God this way because we're not gonna get closer to him than our thoughts about him will allow us to, to get. And the reason that some worship passionately, and I'm not, just I'm not talking about the way you perform, because uh, you, you, know, you could be uh, demonstrative, you know, you can be waving and, and, and jumping, and you know, I mean, you can perform in some wonderful ways. I'm not talking about your performance of worship, because if you believe God is impressed by performance, you will perform like, you know, I mean, you, you, you'll put on a show. If, you, if your concept of God is that he loves people who perform well, I'm, so I'm not talking about performance. I'm talking about how you release yourself in worship it has everything to do with your perception of who God is and how God acts in your life. Because if you see him the way he really is, you can't help but worship God. And you don't worship him because you're trying to earn brownie points or because you want to perform well. You worship him because you are in awe of who he is and you love him and you know he loves you. And when you have that concept of God, I mean, when, when, when the worship strums down, you, you're going to open up and worship him. And only those who really don't know God have trouble worshiping God because if you really know him, it's like, come on, God, I love you and I know you love me and come on, I want, I, 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 I want to get close to you. I'm in awe of you and I, and I understand what you want to do and I'm close to you. Well, that's, that's what this series and that's what these thoughts are to promote. So let me just see if I can get in on it just by starting with a single principle real quick, and this one's not one that you'll have any difficult with. No, the first little principle would be uh, the Bible tells us that God is good. Now, here are some passages on the screen that tell us that God is good. Let's just read through them just quickly, not preach them, just read Psalms 86.5. For you, Lord, are good, and you're ready to forgive, and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. Psalm 31, 19, oh, how great is your goodness which you have laid up for those who respect you. Psalm 33, he loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. So the Bible teaches us that God is good. The second thought is, not only does the Bible teach us that God is good, it tells us that we are not good and that we could even be considered evil in comparison to God. In Mark chapter 10, there's a story where Jesus is approached by a rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler looks at Jesus and says, um, uh, good master, 
and, 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 then he, and then he goes on with some dialogue. And Jesus says, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait. Uh, don't call me good. Or the reason you're calling me good is because you're saying I'm God. Because there's no one, Jesus said, there's no one good but God. Now, Jesus was God, and don't get lost in that psychology, but the point being that uh, Jesus was making the point to the rich young ruler that if you call someone good, you must think they're God because there is only one entity in, in, this, in this universe that is good, and, and that is God. And then Jesus said, here's a passage, and this is a very... Very unusual what Jesus was talking to his disciples about. Uh-oh, not that one. Let's go back to this one. Here it is, Matthew 7. Um, Jesus is talking to his disciples. Now, remember, his disciples are, are the ones that are trying to serve him and grow him and learn him and love him. And I mean, this is a select group of people right here. And he's talking to his disciples, and, and it's just a story of, uh, of asking for things from God and, and, and comparing it to our fathers. And notice what Jesus is saying here in Matthew 7. He said, or what man is there among you of, uh, uh, it, who, if his son asks for bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? Now, I want you to notice verse 11 specifically, if you then, look at your neighbor and say, that's you, okay? If you then, this is Jesus speaking, if you then being evil, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And I can see the disciples, when, as soon as Jesus say that, they look around and they say, uh, did he just call us evil? <laughs> you know, yeah. Well, the fact is, the best person on earth is evil in comparison to God. Now, in comparison with each other, we can be good because in comparison with, with some person, I might be good in comparison to them but in comparison to God, the best that I could possibly be is still evil. Look at Romans 3. This is just one of the passages. Verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Look at your neighbor and say, God's talking to you. Yeah. yeah. You say, you know, I believe I know some righteous people. Uh, no, 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 no. No, they might be righteous in comparison to each other, but in comparison to God, there's no one that's righteous. I'm not, you're not, Billy Graham was not, Mother Teresa was not. The, 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 the best person on the earth compared to God is not good. They are not righteous. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who do, does good. No, not one. And so in comparison to God, you know, we are evil. And we have to understand that goodness, which is what we're pursuing, that goodness is a gift from God. As a matter of fact, we've studied it uh, recently. We spent, what, nine weeks on a series called The Fruit of the Spirit. And you remember The Fruit of the Spirit, uh, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It says, for the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, uh, next word, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. So what does the Bible teach about goodness? The Bible teaches that Goodness is a gift of the fruit of the Spirit. So the only way we get goodness in our life is to allow the Lord to fill us up with himself because the only way we as humans get to be good is that God fills us up with himself and himself uh, is goodness, his nature, his characteristic, his personality. Once we come to Christ, God says, all right, I want to give you my personality. I want to give you my characteristics. And here are my characteristics, and I'm going to grow them in you. I'm loving. I'm kind. I'm gracious. I'm, I'm long-suffering. I'm gentle. I'm good. I'm full of faith. I'm full of self-control. I'm meek. I keep my strength under control. And it is the gift of God that, that does that. Now, why is this important? Why would all of that stuff I just say about goodness and all of that and the fact that we're not good, why, why would that be important? Well, it's because we get our understanding of God from each other. 
especially as I mentioned from our parents because our parents have been commissioned by God, and I know this, like I said, is a scary thought, uh, to, to bear the image of God. And we all bear the image of God, and if we're not good, then we all get a distorted image of God. You remember Jesus said, if you then being evil, uh, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more uh, would Father, would our Father, who, who really is good, give good things to him that ask him? Uh, I, want, I want you to see this uh, theologically from the very first uh, passages in the Scripture. You know, in Genesis chapter 1, we get the story of how God created the earth, right? He separated light from darkness and water from the firmament, and he started putting uh, animals on the earth and people on the earth. And then, and then in chapter 1, he, here's, here's what he says as he creates Adam and Eve. Look at it, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. So here's God placing in Adam and Eve his image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Look at the very next verse, and the sequence, I think, is important here. The very next verse, after he creates Adam and Eve and puts his image in Adam and Eve, then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. In other words, the sequence here is God fills Adam and Eve up with his image, and then, then he says to them, now you be fruitful and multiply yourself, uh, produce offspring, and your job, the inference is that your job is to be image bearers of me, and I put my image in you. Now, you put my image in them because that's going to be where they understand who I am. And, and that's what God's intention was on this earth. Now, the problem is when Adam and Eve fell, the image of God within Adam and Eve became corrupt. In other words, they could no longer truthfully bear the image of God because they had fallen in sin. And so by Genesis chapter 6, the earth had become totally corrupt, totally filled with violence, totally uh, devoid of the image of God. And God said, all right, I'm going to have to just uh, 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 tear this thing down and start over again. Yeah, erase everything. You, 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 you've become so corrupt. You can't bear my image anymore. You're presenting a false image before this earth. And I'm just going to have to start all over you know, with that. Now, I'm not trying to, and, and parents, I mean, I am one, many of you are parents, certainly all of you had parents at some point along the way. We are one, or we've been one, or we've been reared by one, and I'm not trying to put down on parents, and I'm not really, I'm not trying to be condemning toward parents. Uh, I, I just want to recall for us the responsibility that God gave to us in responsibility of bearing the image of God to each other and how that because of the fall, we have been unable to present the right image to, of God to each other. And so therefore, we have a very distorted image of God because of the fall that we've all gone through. And no matter how good a parents we had or how good a parents we are, we're still evil in comparison to God. And so because we've been reared by parents and with frailties and faults and all of that, we need to be very compassionate toward families. We need to be very compassionate toward parents. We need to pray for each other. We need to, we need to, we, we need to help each other. We need to bless each other. And we need to encourage each other. But, uh, but as human beings, the only, um, the only uh, chance we have in understanding the image of God is a direct revelation from God himself. Because we can't reflect it genuinely. We're gonna to have to depend on God to give us a, a reflection of himself. Therefore, enter the book of Exodus in your Bible. In the book of Exodus, we have the story of God who has made a promise to Israel coming to a man on the backside of the desert who really doesn't really know God. I mean, he, he, he's been a part of God's plan, but he doesn't really know God. He's called up to a burning bush, and God says, uh, take off your shoes, Moses, because you're standing on holy ground. And, and then he says, I want you to go down, and I want you to uh, deliver Israel out of bondage down in Egypt. They've been in bondage for 400 years. 
And Moses has been on the backside of the desert trying to run away from a murder charge down in, in Egypt because he killed a, a, an Egyptian. And so, so he's back there on the backside and he's called to a burning bush. And, and God says, all right, now listen, I want you to go down there and I want you to get those kids out of there because I'm, I'm, they've been crying for the last uh, 250 years and it's time to get them out of there because I made a promise to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and, and, and it's time for that promise to be fulfilled. So I want you to go down there and get them. And, and let me just say this to you and I don't want this to sound sacrilegious, but um, God and the children of Israel and Moses uh, uh, don't get along from the, from the very first time they met. Uh, Moses, when God says, go down there and get them, you know, what did Moses say first? Moses says, no, I'm not, I'm not going, I'm not going. Uh, uh, no, and God had to persuade Moses to, to go in spite of the fact, and he said, you can, you know, I'm gonna let you take Aaron, your brother, with you, and he can speak because I know your excuse is you can't speak well, so I'm gonna let him go with you. By the way, because of that, you know, did you know that Aaron never did say anything to Pharaoh? I, I, you may not be aware of this. <laughs> he didn't say a word. The only thing Aaron did was make things more difficult for Moses because Aaron was the one that built the golden calf around which the children of Israel were dancing and idol worshiping when Moses came down. I mean, Aaron was never anything but really a, 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 a hardship to Moses. But, 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 but Moses said, you know, Moses said, no, I mean, look at this dysfunctional relationship. God says, go. Moses says, no. All right. From the very moment that God began to bring Israel out of Egypt, every time something happened, if they didn't have any water, if food was running short, uh, if the enemy was closing in, it, if it looked like things were getting hard, every time that happened, the children of Israel looked at God looked at Moses and said, weren't there enough graves in Egypt to bury us in? Did you have to bring us out in this desert so that you could kill us out here? I mean, every time, God, there was constant mistrust uh, on the part of Israel toward God because every time something happened, they blamed God for, not do, for, for only bringing them out there in order to kill them. And then God was angry many times at Israel and angry at Moses because of their relationship with him. In, in other words, from the very first meeting that uh, the children of Israel and Moses and God had, they were out of fellowship with each other and they were constantly at odds with each other. So when we come to the book of Exodus chapter 20, in chapter 20, Moses goes up on the mountain and Moses is called by God to receive the commandments at the hand of God and to talk to God on the mountain. And when he goes up on the mountain, God begins to speak to him. And God begins to give him the Ten Commandments that are written with the finger of God. You remember this story? You've read the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. Uh, he also got the commandments of the tabernacle. He also got all the rules and restrictions for land ownership, for property ownership, for judgment and justice and rulership. I mean, he, he, he receives all of the truth and commandments and restrictions of God. It took a long time for Moses to get all of this stuff. The Bible says that he was up there this first time on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Well, when he was up there for 40 days and 40 nights and the children of Israel weren't up there, they were down in the camp, they began to think, well, I don't think Moses is coming back, so we need to get on with life and do our own thing. And so Aaron, uh, what do you want? I mean, we need to get us a God to lead us. And so they start breaking up their jewelry. They, they, they give all the gold. Aaron melts it down, makes an image of a golden calf, puts it out there in the camp, and the children of Israel begin to say, that's our God. That's who brought us out of Egypt and so forth. And Moses is up on the mountain with God. And about this time, God looks at Moses and says, Moses, you need to get back down to the camp because those kids of you yours are really, uh, you know, they're a mess. Yeah, they're a mess. And you need to get on down there because he said, you know what, now this is God's talking. He said, because you know what I'm fixing to do? I'm fixing to wipe them off of the face of the earth. That's what I'm fixing to do. I mean, they look, and Moses said, no, God, don't do that. Because if you do that, all the other nations will say that you just brought them out of Egypt so you could kill them. And you don't want a bad reputation like that, God. And, and Moses is just pleading the case of Israel. And Moses, and, and God says, get out of the way, Moses. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just wipe them out right now. And, uh, and, and he said, but now you, uh, you just stay right Right there because I'll make a great nation out of you. And Moses said, no, God, don't do that. And he said, well, you better get down there and do something. So here comes Moses back down off the mountain with the Ten Commandments of God. And when he gets down there, the children of Israel are dancing and having an orgy and partying naked, dancing around this golden calf. 
and doing all kind of lewd acts and so forth and saying, that's our God, that's who delivered us. I mean, giving credit to that golden calf for bringing them out of Egyptian, blah, blah, blah. And Moses is so angry, he just throws the commandments down. They bust into a million pieces and God just opens up the earth and begins to destroy some of them. And uh, this is just a mess. Read, 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 read Exodus 32 and you'll see it's just a mess. And, and, and so... Uh, God says to Moses, he says, you know, uh, I, I promised Abraham that I was going to take his descendants into a land that flowed with milk and honey. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be true to my word. I'm going to stay true. I'm going to take those descendants in. But now listen to this. But God said, but I'm not going with them. He said, I'm going to send my angel ahead of them. And the angel's going to take care of them. The angel's going to prepare the way. And, and, but I'm not going to go with them because if I go with them, listen to what God said. If I go with them, I'm going to consume them. That's right. That's exactly right. He said, if I get near them, I'm going to burn them up because they are just, they, I mean, they're just a stiff neck. God called them a stiff necked people. Now look at your neighbor and say, I believe he's talking about you. Okay. Man. Yeah, stiff neck means stubborn. There are stubborn people, and, I'm, and, and God said, all right, so I'm going to send, I'm going to send my angel with them, but I'm not, I'm going to stay back, and I'm not going with them. And so Moses carries that information, and, and, and then Moses looks at God, and, and, and Moses says, here's what Moses says to God. He says, all right, now, obviously, I'm missing something here. Uh, obviously, I'm not really catching what's happening here, because I, there's bound to be something that I don't know about this. So Moses asked God to give him a revelation of himself, of God. He says, obviously, I'm not seeing like I need to see. So God, I need for you to show me who you are and, and what this is all about. And so God gives Moses a revelation of himself so that Moses can see God through new eyes. And so here we have four stages of Moses' revelation of God. And in stage one, we see Moses seeing God through eyes of the past, which is where often we see God. We, we look at God through, through old eyes. We, we see God in the way of the past, not, not, not new eyes, not the way that he is now. And so God, Moses is seeing God through old eyes, and so God is now going to have to lead Moses to see him in a different way. Now, you might ask, why in the world would Moses have such a struggle in seeing God the way he needs to see God? Well, let me ask you this question. Who was Moses' father? Well, you say, well, Moses' father was some Jewish man, right? And you'd be right, because you remember Moses is Jewish, right? Moses is Jewish Son, what happened was when he was born, Pharaoh, there was in, in Exodus chapter one, I don't mean to go back into eternity, but in, in Exodus chapter one, uh, the, the book of Exodus starts off by saying, and there arose a Pharaoh in the land who did not know Joseph. You remember Joseph, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and his son Joseph. Joseph was one that built the wheat grains and kept everybody alive and became second commander in Egypt. Well, Joseph had died, and there was a Pharaoh who now came to power who didn't remember Joseph. And so this Pharaoh gets intimidated by all these Jews. All these Jews are, are serving well, they're growing, they're multiplying, they're just become, they're taking over the land. And so the Pharaoh becomes intimidated by this, and the Pharaoh gives the order. He says to them, he says, uh, what, all you midwives, whenever these Jewish people have baby boys, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take those baby boys, and I want you to take them to the Nile River, and I want you to drown them in the Nile River. Every, every Jewish boy, I want you to take them and kill them in the river. Well, Moses' mother hears about this, and you remember the story. Moses is about three months old, roughly, and she builds this basket, uh, this boat out of reeds, and she puts pitch in it, and she lays little baby Moses in it, and she, she goes to a certain spot, and she floats this little basket right out on the Nile River, and as the basket is floating on the Nile River, Pharaoh's daughter is coming down to bathe in the river like she does every day, and she sees this basket, and she takes this little baby, and she says, oh my, and her compassion is on this baby, 
And then she needs someone to help her, you know, rear this child. And she gets Moses. Moses' mama just kind of appears and says, whoa, hey, you need some help with that baby? I'm, I'm here, you know. And so she gets Moses' mother to help become her baby nurse and rear her own son. But the point is, where did Pharaoh's daughter take baby Moses in order for him to be reared? Well, she took him back to the palace of Pharaoh, right? So what I'm getting to is the father figure for Moses, the man who, who represented the image of, uh, of God or, or earth, whatever you might want to call it, was one of the most evil, wicked people that have ever lived on this earth. And so the concept became that Moses really couldn't understand God because his image of God was shaped through Pharaoh, who was one of the most evil men that ever lived. And you need to know this also, uh, the, uh, the nation of, I of, of Egypt had many gods. They had all kinds of gods. All these gods were impersonal. They were all gods of vengeance. Every one of them were mean and angry and they were to be feared. And the only way that you could uh, survive as an Egyptian with all of these gods that they had was for you to present a sacrifice in order to save your own life. And so there was no concept on earth of a personal God who cared about people's lives. And remember, the Jews didn't have a Bible at this time. They just had oral tradition. And so they heard about Abraham. They heard about Isaac. They heard about Joseph, uh, Jacob. They heard about Joseph. They heard about all these people, but they didn't know God. And so even though they had heard great things about some God that uh, you know, would bless them, they, they, they didn't know God. And the concept of a loving God that cared about them uh, who heard their cries, who wanted to protect them. And they, they just didn't have any kind of concept of this at all. So even though Moses had seen more miracles and performed more miracles than any man alive, Moses didn't really know God. Moses knew about God. Moses knew the power of God. Moses had seen the miracles of God. But obviously, Moses did not understand the heart of God. And because he didn't understand God's heart, he didn't really know who he was. Look, look at this passage. This is Exodus 33. Then the Lord said to Moses, depart and go up from here, you and the people whom I brought out of the land of Egypt to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give it. And I will send my angel before you, and I'll drive out the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, and the Termite, and the Ruba. Uh, <laughs> works every time. Um, go, up, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, and I'll not go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way, for you are stiff-necked people. And when the people heard this bad news, they mourned and, they, and no one put on his ornaments. Uh, everybody say jewelry. And nobody put their jewelry on. For the Lord said to, uh, said to Moses, say to the children of Israel, you're a stiff-necked people. Uh, I could come up in your midst in one moment and consume you. Now, therefore, take off your jewelry, take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do with you. In other words, God says, I got to do something with you. And uh, while I try to decide what you do, get your, get your jewelry off because you, you're not going anywhere. And, and so this is, this, is, this is how God, this is how the people knew God. This is, this is the, uh, uh, seeing God through old eyes. And Moses says, I need, a, I need a revelation from you, God, because I can't get it from my parents. I can't get it from others on the earth. I, I, there's no one that bears your image. You show me who you are. And so here's Moses asking for new eyes in Exodus 33. And Moses said, please show me your glory. He looks at God and says, God, I need to see your glory. You remember what glory is, right? Glory is the essence of who you are. Glory is the outward manifestation of who you are on the inside. So Moses is literally asking God, God, I need to see you the way you really are because I can't, I don't know you. I, I, I don't have any image of you. There is no image of you on this earth as being a good God, a loving God, a kind God, a gracious God, a God that I would want to be near. I only see gods of vengeance and gods of wrath and gods of anger, gods to be feared, God who, uh, you know, are angry with people. That's all all I see. So God, I, I obviously don't see you the way you are. So Lord, show me your glory. 
Show me who you are. Show me what's on the inside of you. Then God said, all right, I'll make my, all my goodness pass before you and I'll proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion upon whom I will have compassion. So God is, he, Moses, God is saying to Moses, all right, God, I'm gonna, give you, I'm gonna give you a new look at me. I'm gonna show you uh, who I am and I'm gonna let you see me and so that moves us into stage three. God's going to do this. Stage three is a divine revelation of the goodness of God. So God says, all right, I'm going to let you see who I am. I'm going to let you see uh, uh, what I'm about. And so now we're about to read the greatest passage in the Bible concerning who God is. And the reason this is the greatest passage in the Bible concerning who God is is because this is God telling us who he is. This is not another man saying, let me tell you who God is. This is God himself saying to us, here is who I am. And notice in, in, uh, in Exodus 34, now the Lord descended in the cloud. You remember Moses says, all right, show me your goodness. And God said, all right, I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to show you my goodness. I'm going to let my goodness pass before you. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood, and stood uh, with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed Here's the name of the Lord. This is what God said. All right, here's my name. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and in truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the father, uh, the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and on the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And so God says, all right, here's who I am. I am the Lord. He's proclaiming his name. I'm the Lord, you ask me my name, here's my name, the Lord, the Lord God, and then he starts describing who he is. You remember he said, I'm gonna let my goodness pass before you. Well, what is the goodness of God? The goodness of God are the attributes of God that God is full of. And God begins to describe himself by telling us these seven attributes of God. What, who is God? What is God? How does God want us to look at him? Well, here are seven attributes, and God says, this is what I am, this is who I am, this is what I'm full of, and this is what I want you to see. The first thing God says is, I want you to know that I'm merciful. Now, you remember last week, or maybe you hope you do, last week in the message, The Glory of Grace, I, I said to you that the first thing God said about himself in this earth was that I'm a God of grace. Now here in Exodus, he's saying, all right, I, I want you to know that I'm a God of mercy. And he lists mercy first. And of course, you know what mercy is. Mercy is, uh, uh, mercy is a, 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 an undeserved compassion uh, for us uh, that just desires to help. Uh, when, when, when mercy means I, I, God keeps me from getting what I deserve. Uh, God, God holds something back. I, I think I wrote it, yeah, I did in, in your outline. Let me, let me just read this under merciful. Just read you what I wrote on my outline. Uh, uh, God says, I'm merciful. This is amazing. In other words, mercy is undeserved compassion that desires to help. So the attribute of God, the first thing God says is, I want you to know that I, 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 that I have compassion on you and I desire to help you. Now listen, in relation to that, this is, this is amazing because God knows everything about us. I mean, it's amazing that God has a compassion toward us and wants to help us. Why is this amazing? Because God knows everything about us. He doesn't just see in the now. God knows the, knows the pains of our past. God understands the devil's attacks against us. God understands the corruption of the world around us. He understands our sin nature and our fallen and weak flesh. God understands our lack of understanding and the capacity to change on our own. Knowing all of this, he still wants to help. That's compassion. That's what God says I'm about. I, even though I know everything about you, I still want to help. Now, in Moses' day, this was unheard of because there was no concept on this earth that anyone had of a God who was merciful. So, like today, there are people whose concept about God doesn't have anything to do with mercy. They were brought up in a family that had no compassion, 
who had no sympathy going on at all. And so they, they grow up thinking that God is harsh and judgmental and, and they can't grow up thinking that God is merciful. And, the, and, and I believe the Lord is looking at us today and God is saying, you know why the reason you struggle with me the way you do? It's just like the same thing he said. He said, Moses, do you know why you struggle getting close to me? It would be the same thing he says to us. You know why you guys struggle so much with me today? Because you don't understand my heart. My heart is merciful. If you understand how merciful and that my heart is merciful, you'll understand that I care about you. And here's what I want to say to you about my mercy. Look in Hebrews chapter four. Hebrews chapter four, verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest, who's that talking about? Jesus, look at what it says, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. That word boldly doesn't mean arrogantly or brashly. The word boldly means with confidence. The word boldly means telling all. The word boldly means uh, 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 openness of, of, of speech, freedom of speech. It means come telling everything. God is saying, you know, when you come to me, you can tell me everything. Yeah, don't be scared because I already know everything about you. So when you come to me, don't be afraid to tell me everything. Be open with me. Be honest with me because uh, the God who knows everything about you is telling you, I want you to come to me and I want you to come saying anything you want to say because when you come to me, you're not coming to a throne of judgment. You're coming to a throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So God says to us, you can come and tell me anything because I'm merciful and I understand everything about you and I still want to help you. And then the second thing God says, the second attribute is God is gracious. Grace means that God gives me something good that I don't deserve. So God says, all right, I'm merciful. And, 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 and let me just uh, give, give you this concept. Uh, uh, merciful is is a is a concept of 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 emotional um, um, uh, ability of, of of emotional definite. When somebody's merciful, that's an emotional disposition. So I, I'm just saying to you that God's emotional disposition is to be merciful, and His grace comes from that emotional disposition. In other words, God says, "I'm gracious to you," which means I give you good stuff that you don't deserve because my heart toward you is compassionate by keeping you from getting what you do deserve. So if God gave us what we deserved, what would we deserve? <laughs> if God gave us what we deserved, we would go to hell, right? Because we've all earned that. We've all, that's the life we spend. No matter how good a person we are, we're still sinners. We've still fallen from God. And if God gave us what we earned, the Bible in Romans, uh, what is it? Romans uh, uh, 6, 6.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then, it said, and then it says that God, even when we were sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, and, and God has given us the, the gift of grace, which means God gives us heaven. We don't deserve it. And he keeps us from going to hell because God's emotional disposition toward us is to be merciful in life. And then look at what he says. Uh oh, wait a minute. It's right there. I didn't have to pick it. Here's what God says to us about gracious. Now listen to this. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God is able to make some grace abound, uh, limited grace abound. Uh, what is that? God is able to make all grace, everybody say all grace, all, all right, toward, abound, abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. What is God promising in 2 Corinthians 9, 8? He says, you know what I'm going to do to you? Not only am I gracious, but I'm going, to, I'm going to make all grace abound in you so that in every situation, you're going to have all of the grace that you need so that you can be sufficient in every situation in life. 
What does, what does all grace mean? Well, I got to think about that. I said, well, let's just name some of them and I put them on your outline. Let's just scan through it just a second. Uh, for mental grace. All right, God gives us mental grace. You know why? Because no matter how good our minds are, they're still short of the glory of God. I mean, we, we all get confused about certain things, right? We don't know everything. We, we need to learn some things, and sometimes we have trouble learning things, right? Our mind doesn't seem to work good at all times. There are certain blockages that we have and certain things we need to learn, and we're having difficulty learning it and difficulty remembering it. You know what God says? God said, you know what I'm going to do for you? I'm going to give you mental grace. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless your mind so that your mind can have sufficiency anytime it's needed so that you can meet the need in your life. How many of you could testify that there are things that have happened in your life that the only way you could know what you know is that God put truth in your mind? Yeah, you didn't learn it. He gave it to you. And notice what the Bible says in John 16, 13. However, when he, this is Jesus speaking, however, when he, the spirit of truth, everybody say the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes in you, when he has come, he will guide you into all truth. Not, not, not limited truth, not partial truth, but all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. I'm telling you that God will bless your mind so that you can learn things that you have no propensity to know anything about. If it's his purpose, if it's direction, if it's will, if it's his work in your life. I'm, listen, I'm testifying to you that I'm 50, I was 55, 54, how old was I, Tanya? I was in my 50s. And I, and, I, and I needed to get out and work for a living. I'm telling you, I mean, I need it because, we, you know, we started a church and, and the church has a few people and it doesn't have a lot of money. And so it's obvious that I'm not going to be able to stay alive financially by trying to take money from the church. And so I got to get out of here and get a job. And I've been in the ministry, so that means I, hadn't, I don't know anything so, except, <laughs> except how to preach. And, and they don't pay very much for that out there in the business world. And so I anyway, so I have, to, I have to get a job. Well, I go get a job, and I'm telling you, I have had two jobs in the last 10 years that have been two of the most highly technical careers that you possibly could have, that I had no propensity to know one iota of any piece of information about either one of them. And yet I was able to do them and become really good at them and all of that. Why? Because the Holy Spirit of God birthed in me the ability to learn what I needed to learn so that I could pastor and do and be successful and the church could do what it does because God brings all truth into our life. Everybody say this. Truth is not discovered. Truth is revealed. When God is ready to reveal truth to you, that's when God gives you truth. And when you need truth in your life, God, the Bible says, he opens up by the Holy Spirit and begins to pour all truth in you because God gives us all grace so that in every good work, we can have all sufficiency to everything. And one of the graces that cover all grace is mental grace. Here's another grace, physical grace. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That phrase is written in such a way as to say this to us. If, if uh, the God who raised Jesus from the dead, if you think that anything that your body can go through would be a trick for him, you're deceiving yourself. If the Holy Spirit can raise Jesus from the dead, any of your problems will be no problem for him to be able to take care of with the physicality of your life. What other kind of grace? Emotional grace, Romans 8, 11, for the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, uh, faith, mixed, meekness, and temperance. That's really Galatians 5, 22 and 23. I think Tanya messed that one up, but anyway. I don't know how we didn't catch that, but that's not Romans 8, 11. That's, <laughs> and that is Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But that's the, that's the truth. In other words, my, you know what? My, emo my emotions, my character, my disposition, uh, who I am emotionally and strength. You know what God says? God says, you know what I do? When, you, when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, he fills you with the personality of Jesus. When the Holy Spirit comes into your life, he fills you with the character of Jesus. What are the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is who Jesus was. Jesus was love. Jesus was joy, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. Temper. That's who Jesus was. 
And so when we, in our emotions, need the stability of who Jesus was, you know what God does? The Holy Spirit fills us with the character and the personality of Jesus. That's the grace of God that does that. Also spiritual grace, Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. What is God talking about here? Well, he's talking about when, God, when the Holy Spirit fills your life, he is going to fill you with power, with spiritual power in your life. You say, what kind, of phys- what kind of spiritual grace would I need? Well, you need grace to overcome the devil in your life. You need grace to understand God in your life. You need grace to live for God in your life. You need grace to operate in the gifts of the Spirit and the strength of God and the power of God and do the works of God. The, 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 the emotional grace in your life gives you the personality of Jesus and the, and the, and the, and the uh, physical, spiritual faith in your life gives you the ability to recreate the works of Jesus. And to live for Christ. Also, financial grace. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, the one that we've based all of this all grace. Did you know this this is a verse, the context of this verse is about money. This verse was spoken when the Apostle Paul was taking up an offering from the church in Corinth. And when he was taking up the offering from the church at Corinth, he said, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you that, that you always having all sufficiency and all things may have an abundance to every good work. That's a promise. That's a financial promise, first of all. That's God looking at you and saying, look, if you'll be responsible in your giving, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up all the grace of God to you so that you will always have what you need to be able to give what you need so that the work that God's called can go forward. But now you remember from last week, maybe, (laughs) that there's only one uh, condition for grace. You remember the condition for grace? The condition comes from Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. And what does that verse say? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you know what the condition for grace is? It's faith. Faith, I must have faith. And the, and, and, and the verse says, not, that faith that it takes to be the condition for the grace of God to be poured in my life doesn't come from me. It's not, it's not of works so that I can boast about the fact that I deserve the grace of God because I'm a good person. I worked hard. I kept my nose clean. I did what I should. No, that's not where, that's not where grace and faith come from. They come as a gift from God. Not of works. You didn't do anything to deserve it. You didn't do anything to keep it. You didn't do anything to merit it. It wasn't by merit. It wasn't by condition. It wasn't by what you deserve. It's a gift from God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And you know what faith is? Faith is not simply an act of believing. Now, now follow with me just real quickly, all right? I'll get through with this in just a second. Faith is not just an act of believing. Faith is an action. When God says, that we distribute faith, it means that we act on something. Because it doesn't matter what you believe if you're not acting on what you believe, right? So it doesn't matter if I believe that there's a God or that I believe that Jesus is his son or that I believe God fills me with his spirit or God motivates me in my life. What matters is what do I do with that? Do I, do I, do I take action based on what God is doing in my life? And by that, it means, look, if you will begin not just simply believing that God is a gracious God and God loves you and God wants to bless your life, but if you'll begin acting as if God is a gracious God and a merciful God and a loving God, and you'll begin to allow God to approach you like that, and you'll begin to approach him like that, then God is going to do some great things in your life. Because that's the the only condition for all of these promises that God is making to come true in your life is that you would begin acting on what you have in your heart to believe that God will do these great things in life. Yeah, right. Now let me just, let me sum it up. It's time to go and I don't have time to finish all this, but anyway, that might be enough anyway for you. Yeah, we can do it next week. But let me, let me just, let me close it down by this, all right? Uh, yeah, I've got a little bit more to say about it, but um, a little bit more to say about it. Have I gone to page two yet? Uh, but anyway, 
Anyway, let me just, say, let me just uh, 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 sum this down for you, all right, and tell you why I think it's important uh, what we've done today. All right, it's important because all of us, all of us need a close relationship with God. Look, I'm gonna tell you something. In everybody's life, don't, don't, don't look at, at people, don't look at me, don't look at Pastor Tanya, don't look at Bep, don't look at anybody that you, you might think, okay, well, they, they've been spiritual a long time, you know, Brian and Tammy and Bill, well, I don't know about Bill, but uh, <laughs> I'm kidding, you know, I, you know I'm kidding, I love you, brother. Dave, now that's a real problem right back there on the back. But anyway, don't look at people around you and think these people don't have issues and troubles and that they sometimes have great uh, difficulties in their life that, that only God can do something about. Now, here's what I'm saying to you. If you will believe that God loves you, that he is a good God, he is a merciful God, he is a gracious God who wants you to come to him because he just can't wait to bless your life. He is a loving father. He's not schizophrenic. He's not psychotic. He doesn't have a split nature about him. That he is consistently great and merciful and gracious. And he wants to give you these things in life. And just like an earthly dad who wants to bless your life, God is even greater than that because God is not evil. God is, God is consistent. God is wonderful. And so when you need something, when you need help, what, you, what God says for you to do is come to me and just say, Dad, I need you to help me with this. This is what's bothering me. This is my problem. Dad, I can't do this on my own. That I need for you to work in this day. I need for you to go out before and make the way. I need for you to take care of this, Dad. And what the Scripture is presenting God as, and God is saying, here's what I am. I want to do this for you. I delight in doing this for you. I want to be your dad. I get up in my lap and just talk to me and tell me everything that's bothering you. Instead of, you know, getting something spiritual like a prayer list where you kind of feel like you need to make it spiritual and holy and whatever it might be, and you need to do it a certain way, you just, just get you a list and on the top of the list say, uh, this is what's bothering me. And just list everything that's bothering you. Somebody's mean to you. Somebody said something ugly. Your family's out of fellowship. Whatever it might be. And say, God, this is what's bothering me. So, Dad, this is what I need for you to take care of in my life. Because I can't do this. I don't know how to do this. God, help me be a better husband. Help me know how to love my wife. Help me know how to work with my children. Help my children see me like all of my love. What, whatever it might be, only God can do these things for us. We can't do them. We've tried to do them. We can't get them accomplished. And they're bothering us and worrying us. And God says, come on, bring it to me. That's what I want. And that's, when I say you can never get closer to God than your concept of God will allow, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about if you can't see God for who he really is and what he says he really is, you're not going to come to God. You're going to suffer the rest of your life. You're going to go through, through things you don't have to go through. You're going to not get uh, uh, opportunities in life, blessings in life, work, because you won't let God help you. You will keep him at an arm's length and a distance because you somehow feel that he's not responsible and doesn't want to have anything to do with you and would really rather not mess with you at all. But he says just the opposite. Come to me. I mean, come on, sit down in daddy's lap. Now, I'm just saying if just the ones we've looked at, we have, there's some more, and they're, I mean, they're really the truth, too, and they, they say some great things to you. But, but if you saw God the way we've looked at him so far, I'm going to tell you, you would never get out of his lap, right? You'd live in his lap, because <laughs> that's our concept of God. All right, so let's bow our head just real quick. 